Ospensky once said something to the effect, I won't quote this exactly, but I don't think Maurice Nicole quoted it exactly either. I got it from Maurice Nicole, and I don't think he quoted it exactly. So this is just a general, I won't put this in quotes. When a service elephant goes mad in India, that is an elephant that they're using for service, for work. When it goes mad in India, they take two sane elephants and rope them on either side of the mad elephant to teach him right behavior. I like this. I like this because it's something that can be used to give us a practical idea of how we can handle something huge and insane in us. Now, there are some of us who have nothing huge and insane in us. Those are the people who, who have no eyes. They're just one. They have no eyes. Plus, they have no eyes, E-Y-E-S, for the inside. They can't see inside of themselves. So they don't have anything big, huge, insane, this giant elephant inside of this giant mad elephant inside themselves. But how difficult it is to control the emotional center. Think about that. How difficult it is to control the emotional center. Emotions just are there. It's not something that we emote. <laughs> you know, it's not something we have some kind of control, direct control over. We just seem to emote. It seems to happen. It's like a mad elephant. So let's apply this elephant training idea to our emotional center. What have we got that could take the place of the two sane elephants? Did you want to answer that? Did you want to answer that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. It popped which which eye wants to answer it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the eye that just likes to answer things? Yes. <laughs> Anything at all? It doesn't really matter what it is. It just wants to answer. I, I we, we all we have. Yeah. <laughs> you remember in school, the other students who it didn't matter what the question was. You know, they were, their hand went up and they were like, they couldn't just like raise their hand. <laughs> they raised their hand like a flag. You know, they waved it. Or some people used it as a spear. <laughs> see how I'll see how you know they just up 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 up. It was amazing. I mean, uh, I was never really one of those people. You know, I was one of the people that somebody'd ask a question, you know, and I just kind of like hide behind a book or under my desk or another person. You know, like uh, don't make eye contact with the teacher because <laughs> then they're liable to call on me if they know I'm here because I didn't have the answer. The bottom line is, I was a horrible student. I didn't have the answer. I never had the answer. Even if I had the answer. I could never make it come out of my mouth. If I was asked the question, I'd be like, forget it. It was easier to make a joke or to say something flip or sarcastic. Just a little vignette of my past, of who he was when he was a little he was instead of a bigger he was. Thoughts can be voluntarily controlled to some extent. If you make effort, if you work at it, you can, to some extent, stop certain thoughts and encourage other thoughts. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Good. So we have a place to start. We got one sane elephant. Sane compared to the mad elephant that is the emotions. I don't know. Any of you could really call your intellectual center sane because it's not really under control. But you have some control. You have some direct control. You can directly say, you know, I am not going to allow that thought to manifest in words coming out of my mouth. You can do that. If we couldn't do that, we'd all be in jail. Maybe not all of us, but most of us. Because it's a crime to say what we think. You tell the President of the United States what you think, and it happens to be against the law, you can't make any threats, then it's a crime. You can go to jail. I mean, in the home of the free and the brave. Oh my, did he say that? Yes, I said that. There's no such thing as the home of the free and the brave. Let's get that straight right now. There is no such thing. That's a myth. It's a lie. It's imagination. It's an ideal that cannot be manifested because of the condition of humanity. Our condition is such that that can't be. There can't be any home of the free and the brave. There have to be rules. There have to be limitations. There have to be laws because we cannot govern ourselves. Because people, individuals, cannot govern themselves. They cannot control their emotional center. It's a mad elephant. They cannot be allowed to just run free. If they could control themselves, it would be a totally different matter. But since we can't, there's no such thing as the land of the free and the brave and whatever else that means. Movements may also be voluntarily controlled to some small extent. You don't have to raise your arm involuntarily. It's like some people do. I mean, but, but, you know, so Jess, it's like, oh, do you want to answer that? <laughs> yes, yes. You know, it, it, once he's, once his attention is brought to it, it's like, no. <laughs> he can put his hand in his pocket. You know, uh, he doesn't have to do it. 
But he has to have a little bit of awareness because instantly the first thing that happened was, I know the answer. I'm sure I get a gold star for this one. Now, I'm not saying that Jess is an overachiever. I don't have to say that, do I? No. Will you say it for me? He is an overachiever. He is an overachiever, yes. So far, we've discovered that we actually do have two somewhat sane elephants that are to a degree under our direct control, our intellectual center and our moving center. The moving center doesn't have to do just any old thing, unless, of course, you've got Tourette's syndrome. Then you're going around making faces and yelling out crazy things here or there. But that's not a normal person. That's someone who has a problem. We're talking about this work is for normal people. It's for people who, who are not neurologically unsound or... I mean, it's obviously for people who are emotionally unsound, that would be us, intellectually unsound, but not off the chart. We have some ability to control our intellect, some ability to control our movements. So we have the two elephants, which is an encouraging thing. Now, the emotional center is involuntary. What that means is it is beyond our direct control. Our thoughts and our movements are under our direct control. There are certain things we have to do. We have to become conscious. We have to then make an effort to control the intellectual center or the moving center. So those things are givens. We have to give that. The emotional center, I don't care how much you try to control directly the emotional center. You can't because it is not under your direct control. So you're not a failure when you can't directly control your emotions. It doesn't make you a failure. It doesn't make you a freak. It doesn't make you different from everyone else. It just means you have discovered that you don't have any direct control over your emotional center. Let's consider the voluntary moving center. You can walk faster or slower. You can smile or frown. The moving center presides over muscles. We can raise or lower our arm. We have direct control. If I take a ball and throw it at you, there are some people who can, if they know it's coming, not blank, remain motionless for it. It's possible to do that. Yes, we agree. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort and a lot of practice, but it's possible. Can you control in the same way feelings of liking or disliking? The emotional center is the most important center that we have. Of the four centers, the emotional center is the most important. Now, of course, you know, in this work, there are four centers. Two of them are clumped together. The moving instinctive center clumped together in the work for purposes of ease of dealing with them because the instinctive center is something we need to leave alone, and it's so closely connected to the moving center. So of the three working centers that we can work with, or that we need to be working with, or, or, or we aim at working with. The emotional center is the one that is the most important, and it's the one that's not directly under our control. It's the mad elephant, the insane elephant. It must be controlled at first by the intellectual center, which thinks, and the moving center, which acts. Suppose you find yourself negative towards someone. When I say negative towards someone, I mean, let's say that you have a strong dislike of a person. You may not always have a strong dislike of a person. There may be times when you have a strong liking for the same person. Why is that? Well, because we're formatory. Because we're so asleep and we're such machines, we're so formatory that we love them today and we hate them tomorrow. Or we love them right now and we hate them in two seconds. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter because it could happen anyway. Because it's happening. It's not something we're controlling. It's happening. So you find yourself with a strong negative state towards someone. You aim to not entirely consent to this strong dislike of the person. So your aim is, well, I'm not going to give my entire consent to this. What does that mean? It means that you have observed yourself enough to realize that you could aim to not like this person, but you can't do it. You have no power to do it. Because as the minute you go to sleep, or more asleep, the minute you go more asleep than you are at the moment, then in that minute you find yourself strongly disliking the person, or you may not find yourself strongly disliking the person. You may not find yourself until days later or weeks later strongly disliking the person from that moment that you fell asleep until days or weeks later when you may become a little bit more awake. Because once we fall asleep, there's no telling when we're going to wake up. Unless, of course, we've set the alarm clock. But few of us have that kind of forethought where we think, well, you know what, I'm starting to feel like I'm losing energy. I better set an alarm clock. How many people fall asleep at the wheel driving? Well, a lot of people do. Why is that? Well, because when they feel drowsy, they imagine that they're not, or they imagine they can keep themselves awake, and they can't, and they fall asleep, and they end up killing themselves or someone else. But if they pulled over right then and got some sleep, but they can't because they're on a schedule. But if they set an alarm and only got 15 minutes sleep and then went back at it, maybe they'd be better off. And so here we are. 
we're in a position where these are things that we can do, but we don't. We're like the truckers who just press on because we can do it. All this imagination about all these abilities that we ascribe to ourselves is really not our friend. It's possible to observe the intellectual center. It's possible to see the clusters of thoughts wishing to consent to the strong dislike, the strong negative emotions we have toward this person. It's possible to look at them and to hear them and to watch them and to see how they work. It's possible to do that. And then it's possible not to go with them. It is possible. It doesn't happen very often, but it is possible. You have done it once or twice. Now, for those of you who do it all the time, obviously I'm not talking to you. The Ascended Masters should be on that side of the room, not this side of the room. Of course, the Ascended Masters are on that side of the room. It's just that we can't see that side of the room. That's the problem. That's the problem with us. And clearly, we can't communicate with it because even if they had something to say to us, we couldn't hear it because we already know. We're already full. We already know so much. We're already so wonderful ourselves. There's nothing that they could teach us, which unfortunately is our condition. All right, so it's possible to notice these clusters of thoughts wishing to consent to the strong negative dislike and to not go with them. It's also possible to relax muscles. It's also possible not to speak harshly, not to frown, not to take an offensive posture toward the other person, or not to take a defensive posture toward the other person. Roll the eyes, look away, not look them in the eyes. Show your disapproval and your dislike in some way through movements, body language. It's possible to get some control over that. Now, we're not going to catch it all. You have to know this right up front. There's no way you're going to catch it all. Somebody who's good at reading body language, you're going to see right through. That's why we say, well, he saw right through me. <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes. I mean, there are people who can see right through you. Those people are valuable to us. We hate them, as a rule, but they're valuable to us. We hate them because they see through the facade of false personality. They don't buy the lies. They're valuable to us because they see through the false personality. They don't buy the lies. And if our goal, if our goal was actually to become more sincere, more genuine, more real, then we would love those people. We would worship those people. Those people would be gods to us. They would be the ascended masters. But since we don't really want that, we end up hating them instead. And I'm sure you find yourself in both camps. You have clusters of eyes in both camps. Isn't that interesting? You freaks. If you believe in negative emotions while you're doing this, while you're trying not to go intellectually with these clusters of thoughts, while you're trying not to frown, not to be, you know, not to roll your eyes, not to do all that other stuff that shows that you strongly dislike this person. If you believe in negative emotions while you're doing this, the merit then for all of that effort goes into the personality. You become a fox. What is a fox? A fox is an insincere person in the work. It's a person who looks one way, but feels another way. They deliberately look one way to throw you off so that they can feel another way and hide that from you. That's a fox. You say, well, who would do that? This is the time for a mirror, to hold up a mirror. <laughs> who would do that? You know, and this is the time that I would love to have a mirror, you know, and just be able to hold it up. You would do that, and you do that. But it doesn't do any good for me to tell you that. It does a lot of good for the strong negative emotion that arises in you, and you go, well, who does he think he is? He doesn't do it. He does it too. See, that, you know, that whole thing, that whole thing is little more than a defense. It's, it's just a thinly veiled defense of ourselves where we're saying, actually, well, it doesn't matter what I do. All that matters is what you do. I'm not the one standing up there talking and pretending to tell people something. You are. So therefore, you should be judged. And you should be judged rightly, which means I know that you do those things. So therefore, you have no right to say those things. Say what you're saying. Okay. So you get to stay the same. Bravo. You know, so here's your goal to develop. And now you have screwed yourself into place, <laughs> literally. You have literally screwed yourself into a board so that you cannot move from that spot. But it's what we do. If you've come to disliking your mechanical dislikes, having internal chemistry made negative, if you've come to the point where you start to see your internal states and you dislike them, if you've come to the point where you realize what a hypocrite you really are, what a whitewashed sepulcher you really are, if you've come to that point, then you've begun to understand what it costs you to go with those negative states.
If that happens, you dislike your mechanical dislikes. You really don't like having your internal chemistry go negative without your consent. Mm -hmm. It's just like, Bleh, you're just negative inside, and there's nothing you can do about it. If you've come to not like that, if you've come to see the danger in that, if you've come to eschew that, if you've come to, to back away from that, to loathe that, you've got a chance of winning this battle. Not the war, but this battle, this skirmish. You've got a chance of winning. Not a big chance, but you've got a chance. I know, you would really like to hear the whole big thing. And if you really want the whole big thing, you're going to need to go somewhere else. You really are. Because this work is not about being popular. And that's about being popular. Lying to people, telling them that it's better than it really is, so that they'll feel better and stay, that's really not what the work is about. Uh, just in case you hadn't noticed, that's not what I'm about. Now, I know you've noticed, because that's what we're laughing at. I'm not going to gild the lily. The fact is, is we're in a very bad place. Very bad place. I don't talk about it too much, although you may think I talk about it too much. I don't talk about it too much because it's because we can, we so easily go into hopelessness and despair. We so easily turn negative. So I have to give it the light touch. And so when I talk about the other side, about you have a possibility to win this battle, I don't say you're going to win, although there are lots of people who will tell you that. I'm just not one of them because I know the chances of your winning are very slim, but they're not non-existent. And whatever effort you make is never lost to you. If it's right effort, it's not lost to you. And I know that. And I know that that accumulates. And that, that accumulation can gel, can crystallize at the most unexpected times and pull your ragged butt out of the worst situations. And we'll call that a miracle. When it's not really a miracle at all, it's not something that defies laws. It's something that is according to laws. And a miracle is according to laws. They're just laws that we don't understand laws that we don't apply properly. But a miracle is a quite natural phenomenon when it's understood properly. But it's not something that's understood properly because we love to believe in Disneyland and pixie dust. We just like that a whole lot better than effort. <laughs> Who believes in effort? <sighs> Who believes in magic? I do, I do. Who believes in fairy godmothers? I do, I do. Who believes in Peter Pan? I do, I do. I believe, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. Okay, now you can fly. Think happy thoughts. Think good thoughts. Think positive thoughts. Well, you can think all the positive thoughts in the world if you've got cancer. It may help. Oh, I hate to say this, but it in and of itself is not going to make the cancer go away because it's more than the intellectual center that's involved. There's a big chunk of the emotional center involved in that, and that's out of your direct control. So it's a step. Oh, I really feel bad, I mean, to have to tell the truth about this because there's so many people who believe that if they just fix their thinking, that that will cure everything. But that's really not all there is to it. That's just the beginning. That's the beginning of travail. And there's a lot more after that. How can I be so optimistic knowing all this? Because I know more than just this. That's how come. And because I don't take this too seriously. To be negative always means you have no psychological courage, no idea of what's needed, no inner battle, no strength. When you're negative, you're a psychological coward. That's all. You are just someone who could not step up to the plate and deal with the monster that took over your house. That's all it is. You ran and hid in the closet, or you joined the monster. The strong man came into the house, bound the master, and you joined up with him because you thought it would be better for you. That's a coward. Agreed? No inner strength, no sense of battle, no sense of courage, no sense of honor, and certainly no integrity, and no strength. If you've become identified and negative, you believe you're right, you haven't yet shifted to the internal battle area. So when you become negative, if you then identify with the negativity and start to believe you're right, and then the intellectual center comes to your aid and the clusters of thoughts go, oh, well, that's right, he's always said not, and you go with them? What is that? That's the strong man comes in, binds the master, and does whatever he wants in the house, and you've gone with him. The master is your father. So here is your father now bound by this strong man, and you, his son, you now have decided, well, I'm going, the strong man, I'm going with the strong man, he's going to win. What? What is that? Another strong man comes in, what do you do? I'm going with the strong man, he's going to win. No sense of loyalty, no sense of honor, no sense of integrity, no sense of anything that we value as a virtue. Okay, we agree grudgingly. Because this is painful to swallow, isn't it? When you see who you are, it's like, that does not go down very easily. It's like swallowing razor blades sometimes. I'll swallow a six-foot razor blade and then chase it with a gallon of salt water. Wow, what a great idea. And that's why this work can never really be popular. 
because it is so offensive to false personality, and we are false personality. It's not like we have false personality, we are false personality. That's who I am, that's who I identify with. I don't know anything other than that. I'm beginning to see that there is something other than that. I'm beginning to be able to, once in a while, look at that and say, well, there's something else. But I am false personality. And the best I can do is say it and stop identifying with it so much. It's the best I can do right now. A fox may treat a person well outside, but internally be full of dead bones that they're constantly picking. The stuff is, when we're negative, is we don't just let it be there. We pick over it. You notice how you pick over it? How you rehearse it? How you play it again and again? It's such a great song. <gasps> I just love that song. Isn't, you know the song about how he did me wrong? That song? That song about it, ain't it awful? That song? That song about how they, how the IRS is so, and the government is so awful? I just love that song. That's the number one on the charts for <laughs> 10 years in my internal kingdom. Or, if only my wife was more loving. What a great song. If only my wife gave to me like I give to her, then I could be really happy. She could be happy too. Wouldn't life be wonderful that way? If only my husband understood that a woman is different, that we have to have our needs met, that romance is important to us. If only he understood that. And then after working an 18-hour day, would come home and then do all of these things and take me to all these places and... And, well, the bills would get paid somehow. I, well, I don't know how, but I'd feel m m a lot better, and so would he, because then I'd be nice to him. What a great song. Well, that's number one on my charts. That's when, what's number one on the hit parade today, ladies and gentlemen? Well, my song. It's always my song. My song's always number one, isn't it? Think about it. My song is always the song we hear the most, we play the most. Oh, it's amazing that we haven't worn the record down to, you know, like, you can see through it. But it doesn't matter because it's in our memory. It's in our being. And we can play it forever. And it's so deceptive. It's like the siren song, you know, that always drew the ships to the rocks in Homer's Iliad. You know, it always drew the ships. They'd all go, oh, yeah, let's go over there. Isn't that beautiful? That's a, those, those beautiful songs. And they'd go that way, and they'd end up on the rocks. They weren't talking about outside things, people. Homer was talking about us inside. Ah, newsflash. They knew that? Oh, yeah, they knew that and a lot more. We have forgotten. What has been lost to modern man is so huge and so immensely tragic. We should be weeping, and instead we are arrogant and proud and filled with ourselves about how wonderful we are because we have computers. Oh, boy. Computers, yeah, they certainly have made my life a lot easier. I just love them, and I know you do too. When the work is working you, you begin to feel far more uncomfortable through wrong feelings than through wrong outward behavior. When the work is working you, and you have allowed the fox to win, the insincere person, you've allowed the insincere person in you to win, and you have allowed the outside not to show what the inside is, when you've pretended to be something that you're not, when you've been able to sneak off with that little delightful treat, the ice cream cone, or the, okay, or the half gallon of ice cream, you know, or whatever, the Ben and Jerry's, you know, whatever it was, chunky monkey, whatever it is that you snuck off with, you know, you got out in the car, you left the kids at home, the husband at home, the wife at home, whatever, and you went out and you did that, and then you came back and you wiped your mouth and said, I've done nothing wrong, and you got away with it. When the work's working you, you feel worse about that, than getting caught with your hand in the chunky monkey jar. I don't keep it in a jar, but you get my drift. There's really such a thing called chunky monkey ice cream, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Just for the record, I've never, <laughs> I've never actually seen it. That this is hearsay. This is all hearsay for me. It's like, well, I don't really have any evidence of chunky monkey. Well, there's evidence sitting in front of me clearly, <laughs> pounds of it, but, <laughs> but <laughs> all my chunky monkeys here. <laughs> And the chubby hubbies. Oh, there's a chubby hubby ice cream? Oh, my God. Okay. The work's not mainly about the outer life, but about the inner life where sincerity and valuation are necessary. Feeling like an idiot over something you did outwardly is transcended by what you do in the privacy of your own internal world, your real world. See, the internal world is the real world, but we don't believe that. We believe that this out here is the real world because this is where people can find out about us. We can hide the stuff in here, but we can't hide the stuff out there. We are all walking, talking pictures of 
Dorian Gray, portraits of Dorian Gray. <gasps> Do you think he meant? Yes, I think he may have meant that. I think. Do you think he did the work? Well, I think, yes, I think he did. <gasps> Do you think he knew Gurdjieff? No, but I think this work is a lot older than Gurdjieff. I think it's a lot older than Gurdjieff. Thousands of years older than Gurdjieff. <gasps> really? Yes, really. That's what I think. You mean back to the, like the Bronze Age? Yes, I mean back further. That's what I mean. What about the Stone Age? Yes, I think that even a stoner could benefit from the work. The negativity that we speak to ourselves and enjoy about others, the real poison that we greedily sip in private, is what does us the most harm. It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out of a man's mouth that defiles him, because a man speaks out of the fullness of his heart. Well, what does that mean? It means that our inner world is more important than the outer world. It means that what we are doing in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. Well, who will shout it? You will. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Well, you won't have any choice. Oh, you mean it'll slip out? Yes, it will manifest. Oh, that's not good. We better do something about that because I've been having some very nasty thoughts about people. Yes. Our task is to make the inner and the outer correspond like two clocks keeping the same time. Oh, well, that changes everything, doesn't it, then? Oh, then we have to actually look on the outside like we do on the inside. Oh, well, how long do we get to clean up on the inside before we start looking on the outside like we are on the inside? Well, you get as long as you need. Isn't that great? You get as long as you need because it's something that you and only you can do. If you're in a negative state, it's always your own fault from a work point of view. No matter what happened, what somebody else said, what somebody else did, it's always your fault. This is a good place to start. If you can start with this premise and always come back to this premise, which of course you can't, you could if you were awake, but you can't stay awake long enough to hold the premise, to remember the premise. Wouldn't it be great if you could? <gasps> oh, my life would be so much better if I could just stay awake long enough to remember. Look, if I'm negative, it's my fault. It's not somebody else's fault. Nobody did this to me. I don't care what they said, what they did. But what about, and we come up with all of these things. Well, what about if somebody uh, uh, slaps you across the face and despitefully uses you and steals from you? Well, yeah, that's, that's rotten stuff. That really is. I agree. That's rotten stuff. And you have a right not to be negative. Uh, wait a second. Uh, what about all that rotten stuff? What about it? The rotten stuff's still there. It's still done. Yeah, I was talking to Connie the other day about this, and, and she said, well, uh, the sun shines on the good and the bad, and the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. That's true. That's true. So that none of it matters. Well, that's not exactly the conclusion that I draw from those ideas. The conclusion that I draw from those ideas is you have a right not to be negative. Yes, bad things are going to happen to good people, and good things are going to happen to bad people. And that's just not fair. But it is the way life is, it is the way life works, and you have the right not to be negative about it. Now, you either take that power and do something with it, or go the way of all flesh. Do what everyone else does. Have a pity party. Have a Victims Anonymous party, where you all get together and say, oh, ain't it awful? <gasps> oh, what they did. Oh, those horrible people. Yeah, that always made everything better. We do it enough, we could start maybe a whole war with a country. Wow, wouldn't that be cool? Then we could really show them. It's always your fault if you're negative. You must become responsible to yourself. If you secretly love being negative and indulging in unpleasant emotions, oh gee, I wish I had that thing Steve wrote this morning. He's enjoying delicious negative emotions. <laughs> Read that first thing. Yes, I see that I am inundated with opportunities to do this work, most of which pass me by while I enjoy that delicious negative emotions. That's the first step. You've got to see that you do that. You've got to see that you're enjoying delicious negative emotions. You've got to see that you secretly love being negative and indulging in unpleasant emotions. It's the worst possible thing that you can do internally. You've got to see it for what it is. But I don't want to see it. Sorry. Then you don't want to work. Then you don't want to improve. Then you don't want to reach the goal. Then for you, it really is impossible. But if you want to see it, if you want to start disliking it, you've got hope. You've got a place to go. You've got a place to start. You've got some work that you can do. Nicole said, if you are a mischief maker and enjoy the results, then you are pretty low down in level of being. <laughs> now, the reason I quoted that instead of saying it was so that Nicole could take the heat. And I went back to her. <laughs> because I know how much it irritates you to be pinned. I mean, let's face it. Take a cat. If your cat is on your lap and you're petting the cat, and the cat just is there because the cat wants to be there, everything's fine. Now take the same cat who wants to be there and enjoys being pet. Now hold him while you pet him. And that cat turns to claws and get me out of here now. And it doesn't matter what it costs you for him to get out. 
because it hates being pinned. We're like cats in that way. We don't like being held in place, not even if it's a place we want to be. It's like something else rises up inside of us. The cat, the wild cat rises up inside of us. So what? We've got mad elephants and wild cats? Yes, that's right. <laughs> we should move to India. You know, man-eating tigers and mad elephants. It's like we don't have to go anywhere to enjoy all these things. Oh, wow. Talk about armchair travel. We're not asked to like, but to stop disliking and all of its ramifications. This is our starting point. Look, I'm not asking you to like me. I'm not asking you to like this work. I'm asking you to stop disliking me. Stop disliking this work. I'm not asking you to like what I tell you. I'm asking you to stop disliking it. That's where you've got to start. Why is that? Well, because that's the only place you can start. You try liking me when you dislike me, you're going to end up a fox, an insincere person, painting over the holes and the cracks and the peeling paint. Instead of getting down there and scraping it and making proper preparation, doing it right so that it'll last, so that it works. Later, when you feel negative emotions like a stomach ache, you'll seek to transform your inner state for your own health. Now we don't see negative emotions like a stomach ache. We see negative emotions like dessert, which gives us the stomach ache. But we never connect the stomach ache with the dessert. Wow, I must have had some bad clams. <laughs> you know, it's like, it wasn't the dessert. It's never the dessert. Oh, I, maybe I drank too much. Oh, no, it's never that. I'm pretty sure that that meat was rancid. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that those potatoes, that cheese had turned, you know. It's always something else. Or it's the peas. It was the peas in Connie's world. Connie doesn't like peas. So it was the peas. It was definitely the peas. It's amazing to me how many people quit meditating because they have unpleasant experiences in their life. They start meditating. No, they had unpleasant experiences in their life. But they start meditating, and then they keep having unpleasant experiences in their life. But now all the unpleasant experiences are because of the meditation. And so they quit meditating. Well, do all the unpleasant experiences stop? Well, no. They change a little. Why do they change a little? Well, because unpleasant experiences are always changing. I mean, they're not always the same unpleasant experiences. Let's face it. You don't have the same unpleasant experiences all the time because after a while, you get so used to it, it wouldn't even be unpleasant anymore. So it has to keep changing to keep it fresh. It's like being tortured. You know, they got to give you time not being tortured so that you can feel what it's like not to be tortured. Because then when they start to torture you again, it's really torturous. Like, we're sick. But we don't know it. We think we're well. And that is our first problem. Now we need help. Later, when we can see the negative emotion like a stomach ache, when we can see it for what it is, we'll work because we know that the only way to be healthy internally is to work. Right now, we need help. Then, you'll need to know and understand all that the work teaches and not simply give it a casual glance, something that you could take or leave. See, this work for us now is something that, you know, it's like, well, that's... That really makes a lot of sense, you know. This is, this is worth investigating. This is worth a try. It's not like the air you breathe. But when you want to get rid of the stomach ache for your own internal health, when you want to get rid of negative emotions because you hate them, you loathe them, then this work shifts and it becomes like the air you breathe. And it becomes that important, that valuable to you. That's when you'll need to know and understand all that the work teaches, not just a little bit here and a little bit there. Now we approach the work pretty much like a cafeteria. Oh, well, I'll have some of this. and I'll, Oh, wow, that looks good. I'll have some of that. Oh, I don't want any of that. And then we just pass that up. We'll come back to that maybe some other time. Maybe tomorrow or next week or next year. Maybe they won't have it next year. Oh, that'd be good. Maybe they'll never have that again. I just hate it when they serve that. But that's how we approach the work. You see that? Yes. Okay. The work must become real. It takes time, inner courage, bravery, determination until something new is born, distinct from life. What we have now is born of life. It's born of this world. It's born of this life. And that's why it's all false, because this is all false. But what is real, distinct from life, that's something that we need to discover. This is called a point in the work. At this point begins new development of which the work speaks. Man is created as a self-developing organism, the work says. But you've got to reach that point before you can be called a self-developing organism. Until then, you're sheep, cattle, food. And that's the truth of it. And if you can see that truth and accept that truth and start to hold that truth as a standard in your life, suddenly you start to scramble. Oh, wait a second, I'm food. I don't think I like that too much. Something's going to eat me if I get negative. Yes. Something is going to start sucking your life force when you get negative because you put yourself in the diner. You've put yourself on the menu. 
You put yourself there. You put yourself under bad influence. You're hanging with the wrong crowd. What crowd are you hanging with? You're hanging with the vampires, the werewolves, the monsters, the Frankensteins, you know, the ones who grind their bones to make their bread. Well, what are they? <laughs> Don't go there. That's not what this is about. This is about what kind of influences you can get yourself under. Get yourself under better influences. The thing about this work is it's inside, not outside. That doesn't mean that we don't work outside. We do, but we work from the inside to the outside, not from the outside to the inside. Although there are times when we work from the outside to the inside, for example, we have the intellect and the moving center at work roped on either side of that mad elephant, the emotional center that we can't control directly, to keep it in line and to teach it right behavior. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach our emotional center right behavior, and right behavior is not negative emotions.